The time is, well, the date is October 3rd, 2023, and the time is 6.34 p.m. Um, I am going to open the meeting for those attending tonight's meeting. You should be aware that the meeting is being audio and video recorded by APAC and ASRSD. Any audience members who wish to record any part of the meeting must inform the chairperson who will announce the recording. This is to comply with the Massachusetts Fair Tap statute. The listing, listings of matters are those reasonably anticipated by the chair, which may be discussed at the meeting. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed and other items not listed may also be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by the law. Can we do roll call? Mr. Brasnihan? Mrs. Menard? Here. Mr. Quinty? Here. Mrs. Rishu? Here. Mr. Ruprecht? Here. Mrs. Stan? Here. All right, let's do the pledge. A couple of choices. Sorry. Yeah. Recording in progress. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. All right. Public participation. Do we have anybody online? No. No. Um, here I'll give it 10 seconds okay um, I'm gonna move on to the consent agenda so we are completing the vote for our warrants that we have reviewed in our school committee folder online prior to now um, we also have them listed in our agenda. And we are saving money right now, and I am grateful for it. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, we're also entertaining the vote as well for our minutes for release for September 20th, 2023. Uh, we have two executive sessions as well which were Tuesday, May 4th, 2023, and Tuesday, June 6th of 2023. Um, does anybody have anything that they would like to discuss in relation to our regular session minutes, our executive session minutes, or our warrants? No? Okay, so I will entertain a motion. I don't think I can do it because I wasn't here. Okay. I'd make a motion that we approve the regular session minutes um, from September 20th, executive session minutes from May 4th and June 6th, and the account payable and payroll warrants listed on our agenda. Do I have a second? Second. second. Awesome. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. We will move forward. All right. We're going to go right on to new business. And we're gonna start with our spring 2023 MCAS accountability presentation by Mr. Cleary. Take it away. Thank you. Um, so we wanted to take, so over the next two meetings, uh, you're gonna hear from each of the school principals and assistant principals about their school improvement plans for the 23-24 school year. And so traditionally, I will provide kind of an overview presentation of MCAS data. So that will at least make a connection to the school improvement plans that are existing. That way it doesn't go into too deep of an analysis of the information. So the focus will be more on the goals of the school improvement plan and less about the details within the data. So. I have a few slides. We used, I felt like the presentation that we had last year, which provided kind of a 10,000 foot view of MCAS information, provided just enough to keep people informed about what the trends are in the information and open up some opportunity for some time and didn't give people that glazed over expression that often happens when we go into a data presentation. 
So I wanted to share a little bit about the 23 MPAS information. So um, last year, it was, a, it was next generation MCAS for all of our grades and all of our subjects, grades three through 10. Computer-based testing happened for every student in the district with the exception of those that had accommodations that required them to take it in paper. Um, and accountability reports, which were not really in existence in their full entirety uh, over the past several years due to COVID, are back. Uh, and so the comparison has been made to 2022. So accountability calculations are determined based on a 40%, 60% weighting process. So 40% is based on the scores from 2022, and 60% is based on the scores from 23. The accountability reports that we have been looking at, they contain all of the information, indicator targets, progress ratings, and basically a big comparison to our, what our COVID baseline was. Um, one piece to note is that the lowest performing students, which is a determination for the accountability process uh, for our high school students, for our 10th grade, was not determined, was not calculated this year for any school across the Commonwealth. That will be factored in next year. So we start with a bit of a snapshot into ELA. So I'm focused on the proficiency ratings that are here. So this is a collection of all of the performance of ELA uh, performance across the district, grades three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 10. Those are all the grades that are tested for ELA. And this is a com combination of all of the information. What you can see from this is that our ELA performance has remained reasonably steady. We're still above the state average and heading in the direction that we would like to be heading, genuinely northeast, trying to return to our COVID baseline time and then get beyond that. That's the goal. Um, so across the board, we had reasonable increases. I'm not gonna go into each of the specifics about grade levels and schools and specifics, but general trend is ELA is moving in the, in the northeast direction, which is where we're looking for. When we look at math, we, our math performance has remained reasonably consistent from last year to this year. And so looking at this information, we're staying at, and based on proficiency, at the state average. Um, so we're obviously looking to continue to improve on this. But if you remember last year, we focused on that dip that happened in 2021 because math was impacted a little bit more significantly than ELA due to the, um, due the COVID shutdown and so on. Um, and so what we saw during that time is that our return, we were looking for a return to normal, return to baseline. So you can see if you compare 2018 and 2019, you see where our curve was a little bit higher over there versus where it is in 22, 23 is a little bit lower. So that is consistent. If you look at the state average, that's pretty consistent across the state too. So we're mirroring the state. Yes, Joyce. Yeah. Sure. Um, so the uh, question there is, so that's the peak there was, two, I can't see this, so peak there was 2019 or 18? 19. 19. And um, so you're seeing that pretty much across the state. Are they um, laying that in anybody's reasoning or door that why are we seeing that? Why aren't people coming? Why isn't, hasn't the math come up? Uh, people haven't identified a but specific the reason state, for that. It must be a COVID yep. leftover, can, but has anybody made an analysis of it? Not a specific one that would indicate here's the exact reason why this is happening, but the reality is, is that most of the COVID time period impacted our students with a lot of their foundational skills, and I'll say that for literacy and for math. Mm -hmm. Given the nature of mathematics and that it's sequential, uh, by and large in terms of kids learning a strategy and a practice and a skill and then developing that along prog a progression over time, they miss out on some things. So filling those holes takes a little bit more time. So the mathematics recovery is taking a little bit longer across the state than the ELA recovery. The ELA recovery, the standards in ELA, they get growing, they increase in complexity, but the nature of those standards is reasonably the same. You're looking at evidence from text and basically forming an argument, depending on what that looks like. It's increasing complexity from grade three to grade 10, but the reality is the practice, the skill, is still, for the most part, the same. So you'll see some of the concerns that they had had, which I'll share in a little bit. Let me get through some of the other slides well, and I mean, we can come back to that. When you said it was across the state, then you start wondering, like, where, at what door are they laying that? Well, the other thing to remember, well, too, is, is ELA is used and practiced through all other subjects, and math really isn't, right? So there's a lot more opportunity to read and use reading strategies in all subjects where, where math 
stands alone. Though we should, we should do that as much as we can, it, mm -hmm. it is more of a standalone to math and science and not quite as linked into to ELA and social studies um, as, as probably as much as it should be. But that, I'm not saying that is the exact reason, but that certainly well, I mean, is, just, is one of them. You know, you have to say, since ELA didn't came back a little bit more, you just say, well, what do we need to do? Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a statewide thing. It's yeah. probably a nationwide thing if we do, if we had any equal evaluations. So you start saying, well, how do we fix this? Um, <laughs> can, if I may, if I can just ask that, because I have a number of slides in here, I think it's seven or so I slides. I was just about to and say toward the, the same end, thing. Yep. There's a next steps and a section that says like what we're going to do with this information and what some analysis looks like. Just when you get like. to that, I forget my question. I get that. So, but the, I think the challenge is for me as I'm presenting yeah. it, I sometimes forget like the points that I'm trying to emphasize to lead up to answering the question. So I'm trying to answer the questions ahead of time. So okay. I'll definitely come back, Joyce, if you have one. I will definitely come back to that. Yeah, so um, I'm sorry, Charlie, just yeah. before you start. So uh, as a, like a general practice, I'd like to let our presenters present through their entire material because they've been, you know, trying to get this together and then we can answer questions at the end. And I totally get what you mean by that, <laughs> Joyce, but I just want to make sure that they're able to present all the information that they're putting forward since they put the time and effort into this. Um, go ahead, Charlie. So um, in science, technology, and engineering, you'll see that we, there's a decrease from last year to this year. Um, we're, there's a lot of analysis that's going on now regarding this. I mean, the short answer for this in terms of an explanation is we've focused a lot on high quality instructional materials, instructional practices, and time that focuses on ELA and mathematics. We haven't spent as, not, as much time in science and technology. Nonetheless, we've still maintained kind of a gain above the state average. Um, when we look at this in more detail, we can see some, you can't see it here, but we've already started looking at this to figure out some of the root causes for some of this and then figure out how to address that. Um, ultimately, as you'll see in the next slide. So when we look overall at accountability, so this is one of the big things we shared this last year in terms of our accountability values. So in 2022, um, we were trying to return to kind of this baseline of being at 50 or better. And so that's more or less where we ended up in 2022. Moving into 2023, we're hoping to increase on that. We did increase on that. Number of our schools increased in their accountabilities. Laura White went up to 53. Um, middle school and high school remained reasonably constant. There's some explanation for the high school value that's there. And I'll share that in another slide. Page Hilltop had a bit of a dip, but still maintaining pretty significant high accountability ratings. So we're in average, if not higher average, in terms of our accountability as a district. So. When we look at some of the information around accountability, we look at big picture things. Um, and so some of those are accountability percentile rankings, those numbers you just saw, remained reasonably consistent from last year to this year. Um, the growth percentiles in each of the categories for our students and their performance in each of the subject areas were typical. In other words, they were having average growth, some were having high growth, some were having low growth, but staying within the average growth range. We still have some achievement and or growth gaps that exist for some of our students in marginalized groups, such as our students with high needs, our students with disabilities, and our students who are in low income families. We notice clearly that our achievement levels continue to need to improve. That's a big focus for us, and you'll see that in the next slide. Um, and one piece that we also took is that our English language art scores in general across the district, each of the grade levels and each of the schools, improved more significantly than our scores did in math and in science. Um, when we look at some of our strengths, again, ELA achievement and growth, because those two scores are the ones that factor in how well you perform on the test, in other words, what grade you earn, but then also how did you perform from one year to the next relative to your previous performance. So we're still continuing to see higher growth uh, in ELA. We're seeing higher achievement in ELA. We saw math improvement in both achievement and growth from grades K to eight. So we spent a lot of time focused on those areas, focused on our implementation of Eureka Math, um, focused on the support in our classrooms for that. So it's starting to pay dividends. We're seeing some of those changes, which is what we we're hoping for, expecting. We also had a significant focus over the year on chronic absenteeism, in other words, trying to get students to school. That worked. It gave us a lot of accountability points. So in each of our, in each of our schools, we earned a lot of accountability points towards uh, reducing our levels of chronic absenteeism. I had mentioned before we had typical growth. And also, as I said at the beginning, our lowest performing. So in order to calculate accountability, it takes into account all of your students. 
and that's worth 50% of your accountability score, and then your lowest performing, I put those numbers in, I put those words in quotes, uh, your lowest performing students count for the other 50%. The lowest performing students are those students who are identified in the bottom 25%. So no matter where they're performing, there's always going to be a ranking of all of your students in the district, and the bottom 25 are gonna be considered your lowest performing. That factors into 50% of your accountability scores. We made tremendous gains with our lowest, our lowest quote unquote performing groups of students. Um, and that contributed significantly to our accountability scores, maintaining some consistency. We did notice some weaknesses. So math and science achievement we already talked about. We noticed that our EL proficiency had declined, so we have to pay a little bit more attention there and focus our energies on that. Um, our dropout rate, so a dropout rate and graduation rate is always lagging. It's a year behind the data that's in here. So this is focused on 2023 in terms of MCAS presentation, but the graduation rate and dropout rate is from 2022, which is reflected for a year prior to that. Um, so we're expecting that our dropout rate is going to decline, our graduation rate is going to increase going into the next year's accountability based on our 2023 numbers, so we already know that. Uh, advanced coursework. We didn't earn as many points as our advanced coursework as we should have. We noticed that our transition from uh, Redeker into PowerSchool changed some of the coding information that was for some of our courses. So we added a number of courses, Project Lead the Way courses, advanced placement courses, and so as a result, because of that coding change, it didn't get factored into accountability in a positive way for us. So as we go into next year, it will be. And so then the high school's accountability score will shoot up next year significantly. Um, 3 to 12, when we look at like specific areas of focus in grades three, three to 10, we were focused on in mathematics that the area of geometry and functions and measurement seem to be areas that come up as consistently and largely because of the curricular sequence that exists in each of those, um, in each of our math courses that geometry is often addressed at the end of the year. Measurement is addressed at the end of the year. Function seems to be something that has been a bit of a challenge in our integrated math sequence, which is part of the reason why we changed our math sequence to go more traditional with algebra, geometry, and algebra two. So when we take some of the next steps, we obviously have to do some more analysis, and this is work that's been ongoing, that's been taking place with the building admin. You'll hear about some of their findings as part of their school improvement plan, and some of the work that's already underway with teachers developing uh, their own individual goals and or team goals that'll be around areas of performance uh, based on MCAS. We'll be doing some of this work with our curriculum leaders as well. We still have district goals which Dr. Reddit had highlighted uh, last June and then also as part of his superintendent's evaluation report talking about progress. Those goals are still focused and still an area of focus for us. Tiered systems of social emotional support, focusing on co-teaching to address some of our high needs groups of students and also a focus on equity, building that feeling and, and connection of belonging and also focusing our and extending this to focus on grade level standards and grade level instruction which is a big push that's taking place in all of our schools now. Um, those goal areas will be reflected in the school improvement plan. Some of this work prior to the release of all this, we had already adopted high quality instructional materials and literacy. We had already partnered with a high quality instructional materials partner, the Hill for Literacy, to kind of support our staff in implementing a new literacy program for grades three through five, as well as grades six through eight. We also partnered with a math consultant which teachers are absolutely in love with and are thrilled with the work that's happening. So the summer, there was a great deal of work that happened with curriculum around mathematics to change the sequence to address some of these concerns that were referenced in this presentation already and also focus on deeper levels of math understanding within the classrooms. We're also focused on professional development. We have, we've maintained a structure of coaching uh, in literacy and in math, math is with an outside provider, and we have an innovation slash universal design for learning coach that's gonna help with accessibility for our students to access some of the content in the classrooms. Professional collaboration is a big piece that we tend to focus on. In each of our buildings, we continue to try to work with schedules to provide common planning time for folks. When we can't, we put those into our early release days for those Wednesdays. We try to put common planning time there, and we use our curriculum meeting time for some of that work as well to advance some of these initiatives moving forward. And the big piece is time. It's the variable, it's the one variable that we can, to some extent, control, because we can schedule what we do with our time to make it more effective. And so thinking about our early release time, our curriculum meeting time, and our faculty meeting time as areas for focus.
to improve this. So that's 10,000 foot view of kind of MCAS presentation, MCAS information, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Anyone? Yeah, Go um, ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, well, one comment, one question. One, I was, I was buoyed to see the uh, work that was done with the lowest performing groups. You know, when you walk into a classroom, that's kind of how who you have to teach to, right? You're too fast, it just slows it down, and the gap gets larger, you never get it closer. At least be able to <coughs> do a better job at getting people to a place where they can help themselves a little bit more and upgrade what you're actually trying to cover within the classroom. So I was happy to see the focus there. Um, could you just very briefly, way over the top, talk a little bit about um, how the math uh, professional development works, what the access was for different teachers' grades, what the structure of that looked like, and if there's a uh, like post-guidance resource contact with who you contracted with. So you want to hear about last year, this year, both? Bring it. Okay. <laughs> so last year the structure was we partnered with, uh, um, with Leslie University, their Achievement Institute in Mathematics. Um, we had worked with them for the past several years, three or four years, for the implementation of Eureka Math. The structure was largely that we had two separate coaches that were, one was assigned to one building and one was assigned to another building. Uh, they came in on a monthly basis. I think they were in for once a month, which was some sort of combination of common planning time. They would come in, and it also was in the middle school. They would come in, do a planning session with the teacher, then they would co-facilitate that lesson, or the teacher would facilitate that lesson the next day or the day after. Um, and then there would be feedback exchange between the coach and the teacher, so that was considered a coaching cycle. So we had uh, coaching cycles available for all of our staff. Um, it wasn't mandatory that everybody does multiple sessions. We were, our goal was to get every teacher through at a minimum one, and then folks would sign up for more. What we noticed is that teachers were asking for, as I was listening to feedback as we went through the coaching process, uh, teachers were asking for more modeling. They were asking for more opportunities to kind of get deeper professional development and understanding the content and not so much necessarily understanding the how to teach it part. They wanted to see how mathematical understanding developed. And so listening to a lot of these teachers over the span of the year and the past couple of years um, and speaking to some of my curriculum leaders about some of the other changes that they were looking for because we were having trouble with curriculum ultimately, like really getting organized in the curriculum in the way that we wanted it to meet all the needs that we had. And so I made the decision to make a change, to bring in a different consultant to help support the coaching that was taking place in the building. And that started in June. Um, after consulting with the curriculum leaders for mathematics from K to eight, we spent a lot of time talking through what people needed um, and I found someone whom I knew that our staff would really trust and connect with um, and would actually support the questions that they had. And so that started in June with a meeting of uh, 20 or so teachers uh, from every grade, uh, including special education, and that was from K through eight. And the focus of that work was on redefining our scope and sequence in curriculum because we weren't clear about what kind of our core standards we wanted everyone to get. So we had teachers developing these things we call ins and outs. What do kids absolutely need to know when they go into first grade? What do they need to know when they come out of first grade? Defining that for each of the grade levels. Um, that was the start. And then the next part of that has been professional development and coaching. So Allison, Mello has already been on site uh, four days, I think, in the district. I think I have 20 more days with her this year, um, largely through the support of a mathematics grant through the state. Um, and that work has been ongoing. She's going to be here next week, I think, for Paige Hilltop. Paige Hilltop doesn't have the schedule yet. but And that part of that will be planning, individual meetings, co-teaching, modeling lessons, essentially whatever you need. And then in the afternoon, she's going to run a professional development session for the middle school staff on use of manipulatives to build deeper understanding in mathematics in middle school. Mm -hmm. So it's different. It's a little bit more in tune with the needs and the requests of the teachers. Right. Sure. Anyone else? No? Yeah? When do you expect to see results of the 
how, how are you measuring? The well, result? my. <laughs> um, we only were measuring the kids. Right. So first, like, simple measurement is coming out of the meeting in June. We had a scope and sequence of for the curriculum for each of the grade levels developed. And that was shared with all the teachers on the first day of school. They're all following that scope and sequence. That was one. Number two, um, which is not something that we had in the past. Number two, we had a kickoff meeting um, where I had 100 teachers and paraprofessionals <coughs> with Allison on the first day of school, where it was, I don't know, 85 degrees that day, I think. It was a tough one. And we we're in the Cultural Arts Center. Um, and there was a PD session that people didn't want to leave, and that was after two and a half hours. Um, I had teachers in that meeting that literally came up to me after fighting with me for three years and saying, thank you for listening. I'm going to sign up with her immediately. And I was like, awesome. So that's, so in terms of measuring progress, that's huge step forward. Um, then seeing the changes in classrooms. So I've already been in several mathematic classrooms in two of the buildings. I have to spend a little bit more time at Pitch Hilltop. Um, but already in one day walking through, literally one day, I took pictures in three different classrooms of the use of manipulatives, or kids in small groups, or kids working in on particular problems that were linked, um, and then going into a couple of other classrooms at the middle school to see algebra tiles use, being used, big visual graphs that are being done, kids going into deeper understanding of stuff. That's like dipsticking for me about progress. Mm -hmm. That's not something that I've seen in the classrooms on a consistent basis. So now it's becoming a little bit more pervasive. So the next step in that is like looking at assessment information that we'll look at periodically throughout the year and then put that into the collaboration time that teachers have. Long answer to a short question, but it's a big question. Big question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Anyone else? No? Thank you, Charlie, so much. Sure. I appreciate the presentation. No problem. OK. Uh, we will move on to, um, we're going to have an introduction to Mr. Mike Polizzi. Um, and that will be by Mr. Fred Deppi. I do want to say I'm very excited for you in your new role. Um, you know, having my daughter, who actually switched in at third grade the last week of the year, um, and I think you were about the third person that she met coming from a private school. Um, and her response was, I hope I have Mr. Polizzi when I get to fifth grade. 
and she didn't have you, but she made a point of always making sure she came across your door or interacted <laughs> with you. I and I know <laughs> a lot of kids do. So I, I'm excited to see what you do um, in this role because I think you very much embody um, what we as a district are looking for, where the leadership is trending to go towards. So I, I say congratulations in your new role, but I really feel that the district's really getting a gift having you as an assistant principal. Thank you, I, I appreciate that very much, thank you. Thanks, anybody else? No, okay. And then Mr. Do you have, Mr. Deppy, do you have anything else? I don't want it, you have your school improvement plan, right? We yes. So All right. Yeah, so we that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Let's roll into that. Okay. Again, thank you. And uh, we're going to go through this because I know you got a long neck of luck too. So we're going to give you just an outline of it all and uh, continue. So, uh, Stuart Cooper's band. So, uh, so challenges. Um, we're still facing challenges of educating students with some lingering effects of COVID. Things are getting better each year, but we still. See that in there, we're working with families to provide a variety of supports as needed to help them. Locating high quality substitutes has so far been a challenge, but we're working at it and finding more. Um, but I'd like to, on the positive side, that the staff has risen to the challenge. I mean, in an effective way, they're finding ways to keep things going and uh, you know, working with it. We're expanding, really happy this year, we're expanding from last year because you know we had two, um, co-teaching teams, first grade and third grade, and I know my first grade teachers, uh, Rachel McKillop and Nicole Berry came and presented to you guys, and they're back, and now we have um, teams at every grade level, so we're looking forward to that. Successful DEI and SEG, SSG building teams, and returning to live family events, which has been phenomenal. That year was so fun, people were so happy to be back in the building, be together in live, not just the kind of events, but you know, tying in with families, the community, um, High school, we have a lot of collaborations and senior citizens we're working with, and, and our events now are taking a different trend as old district guys that we we changed some of our traditional ones from back when some of your kids were young to the fact that they're now opening and more welcoming to families of all kinds, all types, and uh, letting everybody there. So that's mm -hmm. controlling this life. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Goal number one use data resources and evidence based instructional strategies to afford all students the opportunity to learn in an optimal environment that both challenges and supports their learning. So we're going to continue to implement tier one instructional practices and strategies, maintain schedule of progress monitoring, utilize wind blocks at all grade levels to support individual student achievement, provide effective math and literacy coaching opportunities, as Mr. Caleri mentioned. Uh, we're beginning to work now with our staff to do deep dives into that MCAS scores as we're now getting them in to you know, focus instructional needs, looking at where we did really well with some of the subgroups and what we want to do. We understand, you know, we want to work, especially in the tier one and, and you know, bring that up there too. Looking for an increase in the literacy and math scores uh, as we go along. Next, please. Goal two, continuing development of our core values program. We we'll want to support a healthy and positive learning environment which fosters academic and personal growth for all of our students to the whole community. Continue to effectively grow students' understanding and adherence to our core values and behavioral expectation plans. Collaborate with the equity and parent consultants and coaches in the district. Continue student education in all aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in addition to that, build the cultural competency of all the staff around equity also. Goal three, foster partnerships with stakeholders, including families, faculty members, and members of the community, to develop a true sense of belonging amongst all demographic groups of our school community, promoting the idea and the concept of all in, you know, continue to work with new students, which we're getting quite a few of, and families, different welcome initiatives, tours when they come in those days, give them some school paraphernalia, swag, Provide specific focus on our growing EL population. Our hall flag from the cafeteria has increased. Uh, we now have a flag from Sicily. Compliments uh, the superintendent. Um, <laughs> and it, it is fun to walk into the cafeteria and have the kids just look up at the flags and oh, yeah. get them to question. It really is it's pretty neat. That's it's a so scary flag. I gotta get Olivia on the 
Honduras and Guatemala this year. Those three came in this summer. And it gets noticed. Like so my Mr. Deputy, where's my family's bike? Who get it? It's wonderful. I just have to say that Mr. Deppy actually got the flag from Sicily. He, he did. He, as soon as he found out that was um, my heritage. If you ever look, see it, look it up, it's a unique flag. What country is that? It might be a little scary for elementary school. But. Yeah. <laughs> This year's inclusion of the CAP, Deaf, and Hard of Hearing program, students and staff as engaging members of our school community. Just say, we've been in school one month, and the absolute fusion of joy that the CAPS community has brought into Page Hill Top has been absolutely fantastic. It, it has been absolutely delightful and, and wonderful to welcome them in. It really has. Um, we want all students and families to have a full sense of belonging. And the strength of our community is built upon the foundational components of family backgrounds, high school collaborations. We've had now high school interns coming in, and that's been fantastic. They really bonded with some of the children even early on. And the sense of school spirit and the intergenerational connections, and hopefully we can build that even further. And goal number four, develop the calcified core SEL competency in all students to help all students foster healthy development and strong relationships with peers and adults and become self-regulated students. We'll be continuing with Second Step as our Tier 1 program in K-5, to but we'll also have Tier 2 targeted support during wind blocks. Continue with our building level MTSS um, SEL team, using the research spots that we got for every classroom last year for student self-regulation. We're collaborating with Dana Kendo to effectively implement restorative justice practices. Dana's been in the past two weeks meeting with every, she did all fifth grade classes, now she's doing all fourth grade classes, doing a restorative circle. Help all the students develop healthier peer relationships, and our success is going to be measured by the decrease in recurring negative behavior amongst all students. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Fred, I'm in your room. Um, the uh, EL programs, how many, just ballpark, how many different languages are you dealing with and what levels of English proficiency do you, does it range from like, I don't know, this kid doesn't know the colors to other kids like, well, he speaks yeah, two languages language better than anybody here. The um, largest population right now, Jim, in the past half dozen years has been um, Brazilian Portuguese speaking. Right. Right. But we have um, Spanish, we have Mandarin, we have some Asian, we have some Indian dialects. We've had in the past um, Russian, Bulgarian, we had a girl last year from the Ukraine. So um, this summer we picked up a lot on the Spanish with some of the families moving in and part of that another migrant population are coming in. So uh, and they have all different levels. A lot of them are, you know, down at the beginner level and that's a um, we have our EL teachers, you know, that spend a considerable part of day with them, but also included into the classroom. Right. And then, you know, some of them adapt. They're amazing, though, to watch. I mean, some of the kids, they they pick it up so quick, and they adopt so quick. Um, you know, okay. we're going in there, too, so. They're, they're going to range from not completely non-English speaking to English proficiency, and, and everywhere in between, really. Do, do you see a lot of curiosity between those students and and students that are just you know from here speaking only English, not Fra you know, phraseology. Yeah, no, to be honest, I'm sure they're curious and they'll see. But you know, no, they they adapt very well, and they like to say between lunchroom and recess discussion, you know, they pick up really quick. We had one girl, you know, came from Russia, and not speaking a word. By third grade, she's a chat box, right. <laughs> and she, you know, she picks up all the stuff. I mean, it's the same as Mike mentioned with the um, bringing in the. Um, Deaf and hard of hearing program. You know, some of the children have plans, so you know, they have visually. Um, they offer support in this sign language, um, there's interpreters and everything. And again, the, the, our kids are loving it as much as they are because they're getting to learn and you know in a different way. They're getting to hear different languages. You know, they, 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 how people learn, and they have people there that are teaching our staff and stuff. You know, basic signs so that you know you can communicate with kids in the hallway and stuff. Thank you. Awesome. Anybody else? Um, yes, as far as I know you said it's been a struggle to get substitute teachers and 
you know, probably teachers in general. Do you have any plan as far as like moving forward with the co-teaching model? I know obviously with co-teachers that's more substitutes that are needed. So has that been a struggle like filling the co-teaching classrooms or um, are you able to kind of get other parents to fill that? How do you guys handle that? No, just um, for the co-teaching there was only basically one in my cost cycle we had. We were looking for the uh, special ed person to be the co-teacher at a certain grade level. That took us a little time to summer, but we did find a good qualified person. So they were all filled in, and all our, um, our teachers last spring when we started with the, um, the pilot thing, and then you know, the superintendent and, and Mr. Clary you know, said we're gonna go for it. I didn't have to work hard to find people who wanted to be the co-teachers. I mean, I went to coach people, and they said, I'll take it on, you know, and so that part is, we, you know, we're getting better, we're getting, just getting creative, but, you know, sending out some different things to websites and stuff to find enticing people to come to South and promise them school swag and school lunch and time to see the gift that comes up for me. So we're getting people to come in. So. Could I jump in on that? Because it's, it's interesting because that, that really isn't a new problem. It's always been an issue when we have a special education teacher <coughs> and actually being able to find a sub to do that. What's interesting about co-teaching is, is now when that happens, we have students who are used to being in the regular ed classroom and participate even if the special education teacher isn't there. Mm -hmm. In the past when we were doing pullout, what would happen is we'd have kids who aren't used to being in that class now being forced to be in that class without a, without a sub and typically doing non-grade level work. So. It's absolutely a problem. I mean, substitutes is, is a, a problem, I, I believe, nationally, certainly across Massachusetts. But at least now that when this happens, those students are actually part of that grade level classroom and can participate in that lesson. Whereas in the past, when we were pulling these kids out, they were in that classroom the days there wasn't a sub for the special ed teacher, which was most days that we needed a sub. Um, but now they're, they're, not, they're doing the same, a slightly modified work as their peers. So it's, um, though it's still a problem, um, not a new problem, but this is actually a much, a much better uh, solution for kids, even when they don't, they don't have the sub, um, which is absolutely a struggle. But I know Mr. Deputy has reached out. Right on the mark, I would tell them any time, I mean, I know my people, you know some, you could walk in my school in any one of those deep classes, and if you didn't know them, didn't know the people, I would challenge you to tell me who's the general teacher and who's the special teacher. Mm -hmm. They're both. And who's the spec kids and who's the legitimate kids? They're not different because they're working together in that cohesive team and they, they bounce off each other and they take the group. So it's, you know, you really would have a hard time knowing which one's which. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? No? Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank we you appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you guys in the future. Thank you so Madam much. Madam Chair, we make a motion that we approve the Page Hill Top Elementary School Improvement Plan for um, presented on October 3rd for the year 2023. Seconded. Awesome. All those in favor, say aye. 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 On it, Joyce. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do have concussions. But <laughs> oh, okay, um, so we'll do the end of the year for 2022-2023 progress report with Dr. Renda. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this really hasn't changed uh, much since I presented on the strategic plan. Uh, Mrs. Bozick and Mrs. Wilson presented on co-teaching and um, the tiered system of social emotional support. But what I have, have uh, created for you, and this looks slightly different than last year, is really a cheat sheet uh, for you to um, start the evaluation pro process for goals. So what this is, is the original goals document that was presented, um, actually I did not change that date, my apologies, October 3rd of last year. And with it, what you'll see is the strategic objective, the goal, and the goal on this first sheet is about the creation and implementation of the strategic plan. Uh, what you'll notice when you look under the strategic action steps, it's each one of those action steps and then a, uh, a rating of whether it is complete, ongoing, or incomplete. And the digital version has been updated slightly. Uh, you'll notice number five, the begin implementation wasn't rated, but that is, that is considered ongoing. Uh, but as of now, for the strategic plan, uh, we, we were able to secure a facilitator in LLA. Um, all administrators, except for the assistant principals, um, participated in the process of creating the strategic plan. Uh, and what we did is use the um, superintendent's entry plan and the equity audit as data um, 
to drive the process. And we did present this um, to the school committee, I believe, last May. Mm -hmm. um, below that, you'll see a summary of uh, the presentation and where I feel we are with that plan. And then at the bottom of page two, there are three links that will bring you to some more evidence that um, um, you can uh, peruse at, at your convenience. And then for the second goal, the co-teaching, it's really set up um, the same way. If you look at the tr uh, strategic action steps, uh, I go through and, and kind of give a ranking as to where we feel we are on these. Um, and, and the co-teaching was actually much, much more difficult. And most of these are ongoing. So for instance, and I didn't bring my glasses, so please excuse me for holding this so far away from myself. Um, the school administration is supportive and uh, committed to co-teaching, especially regarding co-planning time, scheduling, assistance, and professional development. That is ongoing. I, I don't know if that will ever be complete. Um, we are always going to have to tweak and adjust the schedules to try to find more uh, co-teaching time for teachers. Uh, it certainly isn't perfect the way that it is right now in any of the buildings. It's much better than it has been. But I think if you were to ask anyone if they could use or want more um, planning time, the answer would absolutely be yes. And I would have to say I, I agree. We need to find ways to provide them more time for this common planning. Um, number two, uh, teachers have not yet uh, teachers who have not yet will participate in school-wide professional development on co-teaching. That one really is complete, but it should be complete slash ongoing as we hire new staff, uh, staff retires or, or moves on to other districts, and we bring other staff in. That training is going to happen have to happen again. Um, number three for the co-teaching, the administration has purchased resources, classroom materials, co-teaching, etc., etc., to support the teaching and the implementation. Of, of co teaching. So, that, yes, we had completed that at some point, but that is again ongoing. Um, we are going to constantly have to update um, those resources and supports for teachers. Um, plans have been developed to, um, for the dissemination of information on co teaching to teachers who do not attend the initial training. That actually is complete. We have a plan to catch teachers up who have not uh, or not able to participate in that. In fact, our consultant, uh, Dr. Deeker, has recently changed from University of Florida to the University of Wisconsin? Yeah. Kansas. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clary. One of those are great Midwestern. They're both good schools. <laughs> They're both good schools. Um, but she was nice enough to allow us to record the last training. So if we have to hire a teacher mid-year, we at least have that recording of the training that the teacher um, can watch to kind of catch up. There, there really isn't a replacement for being at a live or even a virtual training where you can ask questions in the moment, but it is, it's a good start um, for when we, when we have to hire someone midway through the year. Um, uh, number five, plans have been developed for regular, uh, did that one, excuse me. Uh, plans have been developed for evaluating a school's co-teaching program. Uh, we have a, that is complete, we have a draft of that where um, Mr. Cleary, Mrs. Bozick, and Mrs. Campioni, along with Building Administration, will do some walkthroughs um, to look for uh, very specific um, things happening in co-teaching, including um, some of the different models, not always the, the oh, now it's, it's escaping me too, the uh, mutual teaching or the, the splitting of the classroom into, um, in half and each taking, taking a half. So we, we will be looking for different models. Our hope is to eventually get teachers involved in some of these walkthroughs, uh, the co-teaching teams. Um, not to necessarily evaluate the program, but to see other models that are working successfully. Um, number seven, the implementation, co-teaching implementation has been incorporated as part of the school improvement plan. Um, you saw Mr. Deppy did have that as part of, of one of his goals. Um, I would say some of the success that we're seeing with the lowest 25%, our lowest performing students, um, is directly related to some of the things that we're talking about. It is related to the equity work we're doing, certainly. It would absolutely be related to the co-teaching work um, that we have going on. And then that tiered system of support, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, is impacting our neediest students. And whenever we can impact our neediest students uh, in positive ways, whether that's academically or social, emotionally, uh, mental health-wise, we're going to see better results from kids, um, which we, we have for that group. Uh, there's collaboration between general and special education teachers to ensure all students are succeeding. Uh, that is ongoing. Um, again, we need to find teachers more time. 
Uh, we need to figure out some inventive ways of doing the schedule to get that. Um, it's difficult in the short day that a, that a school day is. And with some of the, you know, the, the limited planning time teachers already have to find more time, but we are using uh, some of those early release times um, and other times that we have traditionally used for district-wide PD. We're gonna try to shift that back um, to teachers. And teachers have been provided uh, with mutual planning time for co-teaching. They have been, they absolutely need more. That's why I have that rated as ongoing and incomplete because we have not yet um, been able to find a model good enough that it is enough time. And again, if you, if you look at the performance on the goal, this is a, a write-up of really explaining what um, uh, Mrs. Bozak and I had did last year with, with uh, Lisa Deeker. And then there is links at the bottom for additional evidence. Um, the co-teaching share drive is, is full of uh, information for you to uh, take a look at. And then the last goal was about our uh, MTSS systems, both academic um, and social emotional. And we really had started to shift to focus um, mostly on the social emotional last year. Uh, some of the reasons uh, for, the, or one of the reasons for that is we knew we were switching our elementary reading program. Um, and with it was going to become a, a whole slew of training for our elementary and middle school teachers. Um, so the the MTSS review and work for academic is incomplete. Uh, the strategic action steps um, for the social emotional mental health uh, we have rated as we do the other. So provide training on MTSS for all staff where the essential practice of each tier one are understood. So that is ongoing. That work has been started. Uh, work with the director of special education, assistant superintendent, and the DEI counseling director to identify tier two and three interventions for both academic and behavioral mental health. Uh, that is ongoing. We have identified many of those. Um, we need to continue to refine that and, and find some that are more effective. Uh, identify current supports in tier two and three. Uh, that has been done, but that is an ongoing process to refine those tier two uh, supports so that students can access grade level curriculum. Uh, four, identify staff that can deal, deliver identi um, the identified interventions and provide professional development. So that is complete. We have identified those staff that are able to do that. And identifying track and review data uh, from supports. So that is ongoing. Uh, we need to refine how we're collecting some of that data. Uh, for instance, some, some of the things that we are now tracking are actually um, calls to the office. So we want to track Every time a teacher is calling for support, what type of support they're calling for, what, who's the student they're calling for support for, so we, we can start to look at those trends and see if the students that are getting called for are receiving any of these academic or social emotional interventions, and if they are, are they working? My guess is if they're, they're being called to, um, if they're calling, if the teacher is calling the office for assistance consistently for the same student, that intervention isn't working, we need, we need to make a change. So the performance on this goal is also um, written up uh, below. Again, this is uh, mainly a recap of what Ms. Wilson had presented in February, but there is a whole slew of evidence um, and links of some of the resources that we are using and then some of the examples of the data collection that we're doing. So there's, there's a couple of uh, agendas for you to look at. And I, I wanted to talk about the sample SSG action sheet. When you go on there, all you're going to see is the actual template that we use. Um, we didn't share any, any student information. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple sheet. It's a student name, grade level, what the issue is, what the action we're gonna try, who is responsible for it, when we expect it to be done, and if we need to communicate someone to someone, and who's going to do the communication, and who needs to receive the communication. Um, there is a place here for you to uh, rank the overall uh, rating for the goals, if you so choose to use that. Um, before I move on to the actual form for the evaluation, are there any questions on, on the progress and to be a progress report. Um, yeah, um, just on, on uh, what you see from our, our co-teaching standpoint, do you see any 
differences in inertia between people who are like not new to the district but new to teaching and, and being morphed into co-teaching as opposed to people who have been teachers for 10, 20 years and having to make a change. Do you, do you recognize anything like that? Do you see it at all? And secondly, do you know if the concept is, is being instructed in the undergraduate and graduate levels? So the uh, really all type of inclusion, uh, getting buy-in is typically a little easier with, with people coming right out of, of uh, bachelor degree or master degree programs. Um, it, is, it is part of the teacher training. Um, otherwise, besides that, it's really kind of hit or miss how, how much people buy in. It's, it's a, it can be a huge change in practice for people. Okay. So there's, there's a morning process, right? So someone who's been doing something a certain way for, for years and years, we're essentially convincing them and telling them that this isn't the best way to do this for these kids. We want you to do it like this. Okay. And that's, that can be a very difficult thing to hear and take and you start to reflect as an educator and that you're, you're here to work with kids um, and some of our neediest kids and someone is now telling you, hey, what you did for the last 20 years probably maybe wasn't the best way to do it. So that's a, that's a tough message to hear. Typically what I've seen in the past when I've imp implemented this in other places, year one is very difficult and after year one it isn't. So I, I think we saw that with the people who piloted and I think what we're living right now is we have a whole slew of new teams that are trying this for the first time and they're, they're finding the, the bumps in the road because there certainly are and it's difficult to do and it's a marriage between the classroom teacher and the co-teacher and sometimes marriages end in divorce, right? So, um, and that, that's true for co-teaching too. So it, it certainly um, we see a difference in the people who are in year two and the people who are struggling at the beginning of year one. <clears throat> but what we'll see is we'll see that the, the kids who are receiving co-teaching, we'll see the results are going to be significantly higher than what they were. And really what, what I do when, when teachers um, or anyone is kind of doubting um, why we make that change is we kind of look at the data that we've had and we have plenty for, we could look back you know, until the inception of the district to see that we, we really weren't doing a great job with our neediest kids and our kids with our, our children with disabilities. We were always trying to catch them up from kindergarten and in, in the elementary school until fifth grade and that gap had, had, had been there. There were certainly some success stories where we were able to make that, the, the, some students move, but if you look at the trends, it just wasn't, they were never gonna catch up. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is if you are, if your expectation is for a student to be somewhere on the proficiency realm in grade level curriculum, and they're never exposed to grade level curriculum, it's not gonna happen, right? So this is expose students to all the same grade level curriculum at different entry points so that they can access that curriculum. Um, we, that certainly won't be perfected by the end of this year. Uh, this is gonna be a, a model that we're always going to have to um, continue to work at. We're always going to have to try to fight and, and, and find more time for teachers. But I think what we'll see at the end of this year when this is, um, in, in a way this is still a pilot year because we have a lot of new teams that haven't done it before. I think we're going to see the, the hitting the road at the beginning of the school next year is going to be much easier. Scheduling is going to be much easier. We'll find more inventive ways to find more time for teachers to co-plan. But this, this first year, um, we're, we're, we have to allow all of our teachers who are changing their practice that time to kind of grieve the loss of, of what they've done and support them when they're struggling. And there's, there's been some struggles already in all the buildings and that's to be expected, but really it seems like the staff is, is jumping in with both feet and trying to find solutions to some of the, some of the issues that are popping up. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, someone, did you go ahead, Joyce. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I would imagine, um, since this is in the popularity world these days, are we finding applicants have already done co-teaching, have already familiar with it, so they're not like, oh, um, and um, either they've had training or they have experience in it, or um, they're just familiar. Uh, yeah, we have. We've actually were able to hire um, quite a few teachers who have experience. One that comes to mind is um, Jen Burke, who is a special education teacher at Page Hilltop, had done co-teaching, I believe, in Lawrence 
uh, for years, and, and she really came in with her, um, uh, Mrs. Um, Lynn Oppenheimer, uh, her third grade co-teacher team, they were able to hit the ground running. Um, so that model, even last year, became polished relatively quick, quickly, but the other thing to remember is, is Lynn is also a former special education teacher who transitioned into a third grade room. So essentially we have two trained special educators doing co-teaching in a third grade classroom. But I believe Mr. Deppie hired a couple other teachers um, this year, who started this year, who had um, training and experience in co-teaching. And this really isn't a new, it's, no. it's not a new, new thing. Um, it's been happening for, I mean, 30 I, years. Yeah, for a very <laughs> longer than that. And, and really a lot of the, the districts around us who have done this have been doing it for, for 20 something, some odd years. So um, it's, it's a, even in, there were pockets of this happening in the district prior to, to this. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, this is the first real push here to, to kind of have this district wide at every grade level. So while you have it district wide, um, is that 100% at a grade level, 50% at well, a grade level, 40% um, at a grade level? Well, there's a co-teaching team in every grade level, okay. but we, we will probably never be a 100% inclusion district. So there are very specific reading programs that children need that you would not do in a co-teaching model. Wilson Reading, for example, is one that we use often. Orton Gillingham is another. So for students who need that, mm -hmm. they can be pulled out for that instruction, but what they're probably not gonna be pulled out for math, and they're not gonna be pulled out for social studies, and they're not gonna be pulled out for science, right? So there are kids who absolutely need to get pulled out for some of their services. Speech and occupational therapy is another. Doesn't really make sense to push in and do speech services. Um, sometimes it might if it's the, if it's the um, social pragmatics part of that, but there will always be some pullout. But what we're trying to do is give uh, any student who can get their core content in the regular ed classroom with accommodations, that's what we're trying to do. That make sense? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, just uh, tactically, the co-teaching share drive and the sample agendas and action sheets, if you can adjust the permissions so we can see that. My apologies, yeah, I'll take care of that. I did, you do have to, the way that it's set up right now, you have to be logged into your ASRSD email, yeah. but I'll, I can change that yeah. so that doesn't have to be the case. Okay, anybody else? Um, and we're happy yeah. to print out anything that anybody may need. Um, just one question I had is for the co-teaching classrooms, are those class sizes larger because they're co-taught or are they kind of the same as the rest of the classrooms? Most, the they're, they're similar, uh, if not the same in most cases. There is um, kindergarten at Laura White is a little bit smaller. And I believe, I'd have to check, I think at Page it's a little bit smaller. Um, what we, and we, they start the year a little bit smaller because typically what happens when we have students who move in, a lot of the times they come with IEPs. Okay. And so what would happen is if we have it the same size, we would then be making it even bigger. Well, we know where we're, we're going to get students, a lot of students in September. In, in October and then it starts to slow down but as we get those students in we want to be able to grow that okay. and keep and get it to, to be about the same size yeah um, okay. but we we have to have the threshold is and we try to keep it below this um, but we're not below it everywhere the threshold really is 50% so uh, 50% plus one so we can't have more than 50% of a class be students with disabilities oh, okay. okay so if we have 21 kids in a class for instance only 10 of those kids can be students with disabilities. So if you went over, would you transition other students? We would have to, to transition into a, it? we'd have to transition into another, oh, another into section okay. of, of co-teaching. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and then just, this is more of a comment. Um, my son is in the second grade co-taught classroom this year. Um, I understand a lot about it because of um, Tara's presentation, your mm -hmm. presentation, and I feel like I have a really good understanding of it. Other parents, I don't think they might have felt that way. Um, and I will say, I didn't know he was in the classroom until about two weeks into the school year. Um, it, it's fine. I just, you know, I was told he had this teacher, one teacher, and then a couple weeks in, I found out he was in the co taught classroom. Then the teacher swapped spots, and a lot of things happened. And mm -hmm. I understand that, but I think in general, if I was just a parent and I wasn't on the school committee, 
I wouldn't know what in the yeah. world co-teaching was. So maybe if we could just disseminate a little bit of information to other parents so that they have an understanding of what it is and, and you know. I think that's a, that's a very fair point. Um, I, I, I think that needs to be, it is a district initiative. All the schools are doing it, but uh, I'm, I, I'm gonna own that. So one of the things that we wanna start doing is having more parents' nights. Uh, we're going to have our, this is way off topic, my, my apologies, but um, <laughs> Effective School Solutions, who is offering the clinical, uh, clinical support at the high school, is going to be offering a parent night. Um, I believe the date has been set towards the end of October. I'm not sure of the exact date, but October. It will be towards the end of October on um, um, parents assisting their child with dealing with stress and anxiety. Um, I could be off on that title slightly, uh, but they offer a, uh, a whole slew of parent trainings that we're going to take advantage of. But what we could do is piggyback on that, right? So that's an hour presentation. We can certainly do a 25 minute presentation on, on co-teaching and give people an overview. Um, and honestly, I don't think we've done enough of that or I haven't done enough of that. Um, so that, that is um, an appreciated reminder um, yeah. to get there. I yeah. think just so parents understand, you know, what it is and don't yeah. have a concern like, oh wait, why is, why is my student in that class? Just so they yeah. like, fully understand. Yeah, I think that, that's, that's a very fair um, um, request. So we can absolutely make that happen. All righty. Okay. Anybody else? We're good? All right. I'm going to move on to my section. Can I just, yes. um, I do have, so this was, oh, the, thank you. this was the cheat sheet, right? Yes. So this, this is really for you to fill this out or part of this out, right? So this is the, the superintendent's evaluation form. If you notice that this is the top sheet and this is kind of the reporting out sheet. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go on to page two, um, you'll see that there is a, uh, a section for you to give an overall rating and you can add evaluator comments. And then, uh, and I, this is a, just, this is a DESI form, and I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan Terrible. of this form. Yeah, but, but it is, it is what it is, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, this gives you a place to, again, rate the, um, the uh, superintendent's goals. Uh, I, we have added what, what focus indicators the goals cover. <clears throat> and then the goal itself is actually pre-populated for you. And if you click on that, it will bring you to this document, again, so that you can use that if you need it as a reference. And so that is for the, the three goals. And then after the goals, there are um, performance rating standards for instructional leadership. Um, and there's uh, 1A through um, 1F. And then there is standard two, management and operations. Uh, standard three, uh, family and community engagement. Oh. Oh, okay, and standard for professional culture. Any questions on that? No? Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I don't know if you wanted, if you had a, a time of when you wanted this return to you. So typically how this works is, is um, um, the school committee fills out uh, the form, the chair uh, collects and compiles the information. Um, and then decides to uh, when uh, she would put that on the agenda for uh, public share. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. I'd ask Adam to just kind of encompass everything in his presentation instead of kind of batting it back and forth. So my ask is gonna be um, Sunday, October 22nd, and I just sent a calendar invite with some notifications on there to our ASRSD accounts. Um, so if I can have the evaluations in so that I'll have the the week and I'll have it until the third, so it'll end up being like 30 days, in, within 30 days I would have it and be able to um, put it on the school agenda, the first November meeting that we have. That's the agenda that I would like to have our evaluation report. Is that good for everybody? Okay. So that was Sunday, November 3rd. Sunday, did I put in the calendar Sunday invite November, November 3rd? 5th. Sun, um, it's supposed to be October 22nd. Sunday, October 22nd is when I would be looking for the submission from you all, and then I'll compile everybody's oh. during that week. October 22nd? Yes. Um, but, but um, Adam, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, 
Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I, Adam reviewed the entire portion so that way we all understand what it is. It isn't for those of us that have it electronically. It'll remain in that folder so we can go back to it. And I did reference it in the meeting invite in case you have to go, you know, looking for the folder and for all the information. Um, so that's our plan. And Michelle, are you all set with the, so the date email? or should I still follow up yeah, with you? Yeah, October 22nd? Yeah. And then November 1st, which is a Wednesday, will be our first school committee meeting in November. Perfect. That's what I was trying to say. Thank you. First. Yes, James. I just lost in the calendar. Oh, okay. <laughs> Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, if you are going to fill this out electronically, that is a Google Doc, The what looks like a where did I put it? No. This document is a Google Doc. Mm -hmm. If you don't make a copy, you'll be actually writing on the, the master copy and yeah. everyone will be able to see it. Um, if you would like, we can, I can't send it, but I can have Michelle send you each your own copy of this so you don't have to worry about making a copy. Okay. Would you like, yeah? That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I can't send it because I'd have access if I sent it. So thank you. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for that. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the superintendent's report. Okay. Um, and if I may, we actually have a, um, I'm backtracking here, we actually have a, uh, a copy with the cabinet. It used to be superintendent's copy, but I'm getting everybody involved in it. So, um, and that's scheduled for October. Sorry, Michelle. I know. <laughs> That is scheduled. It is scheduled. It was in the weekly updates as a save the day yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that was like three years ago, so I don't remember exactly. It's on Thursday, October 26th, 9.30. We're gonna try to do those quarterly or, or um, at least three times a year, but, but, but four times a year. And I'm including our wonderful assistant superintendent, our SPED director, director of student services, our nurse director, and our director of uh, equity and school counseling um, for a couple of reasons. Not all the questions are gonna be for me. And if the question is for me, uh, the more knowing other might be someone else on cabinet. And we will try to have those at different schools um, and adjust the time slightly so people um, try to make it convenient for people to come. Uh, maybe we can add a virtual option too. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so October 26th, where? October 26th, the first one will be at Page Hill Top. And we'll have it in the um, cultural arts. Okay. Okay. Superintendent's report. Um, there, we were asked to provide an update um, on school choice, uh, where we are this year, and if we need to ask of the school committee to close. So, we have accepted a total of 20 students school choice in over the summer. These are from students in grades kindergarten through nine. Um, we did this uh, via the lottery that was held in August. Uh, Laura White and the high school have been closed because the number of seats, the available seats are just gone, as well as grades one, three, four, and five at Page Hilltop and grades six and eight at the middle school. We are currently in the process of completing state enrollment report, which uh, will have updated uh, enrollment numbers for you, for you at the next meeting. Uh, but based on the report, as well as the possible surge in enrollment, from our displaced migrant families uh, moving into the shelter and air, we will be requesting the school committee to close school choice for the remainder of the 2023-24 school year. We are very close to our seat, um, our desired seat numbers now, and we feel that, that, that we are gonna get to that point very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, at the next meeting, um, the two co-presidents of ASRIA, uh, uh, Mary Ann Zyman and Brian LaPointe will um, complete a presentation with me about parent conferences and parent communication. We specifically are going to talk to you about parent conferences and progress reports. Uh, we feel that there is an opportunity to um, keep one of the very formal uh, parent teacher conference nights but change to on demand conferences that are triggered by student need. Both by the school or the parent. So typically what happens now, and I won't get too far into it, but we have about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes per conference, um, and we can't get into a lot of depth. And often the parents that we need to, to attend aren't able to attend the nights that we have it. By having one of those nights, 
and then moving to an on-demand, we can actually have virtual meetings during teacher's prep. We could have before school meetings if needed. We could have after school meetings. We could have five or six meetings for one student if needed, rather than what turns out to be um, not the most effective meetings that we could possibly have. Um, so they're, they're gonna come and co-present co with me about some of the, the, the value of, of possibly doing this um, for both uh, from grades K through, through 12, uh, why we would like to do this and why we feel it will be more, uh, more effective. Uh, much of this has to do with online grade books, parents being able to access um, when we work out the rest of the kinks and access a parent portal so that they can see um, grades in the moment rather than having to wait for a progress report um, try during each trimester. So more information on that to come. Um, I did write a sample letter for the committee to review for um, to submit to our local reps about the end of ESSER funding. Uh, this is very similar to a letter that I wrote uh, from the superintendent's office. I have reached out to other local superintendents to see if they would like to um, submit this letter together. There has been a, a positive response. I'm sure um, they, as you, will have edits uh, to this letter. Um, I'm certainly open to all of those. I am not sensitive about um, changing ranks. So please uh, review that and uh, let me know if that's something you would be interested in. But the, the, uh, when we talked about this at the last meeting, with ESSER, the ESSER funding uh, coming to an end this year, many of our mental health and social emotional supports were in ESSER funding. Um, and without an extension or an ESSER, an ESSER 4 possibly happening, um, there, there is a chance that we might lose some of these extremely valuable people um, that we have. I think the, the uh, letter is exceptionally well written. The only thing I would, uh, when you, <coughs> distribution, I'd probably do the, uh, the governor or senator or state rep, and then the federal would be um, the two senators and our uh, representative from the House. And then just, I would also do carbon copies because we're doing presentations to the two boards of selectmen. Send them both out, but I, I, I would not change a thing in the letter. Okay, thank you. We'll just add those and just get them all. Michelle, did you capture that? Sorry, I'm sorry. Can I hear you? Sorry. What we're going to send to all local representatives, governor's office, uh, board of selectmen, uh, state, and um, federal senators. And, Department of Department of Eds too. Did I, did I capture that, Mr. Quinty? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Joyce. Director, do you think it would be effective if school committees would do a similar type thing? Yes, that is mm -hmm. the the letter that is submitted in your packet is is intended to be from school committee. Okay, but yeah. I mean we should um, maybe work with the um, association of school committees and see if they can't adapt something from all the school committees. Uh, and every, we could vote to be on it and have it sent as a major thing. I understand what you mean, yeah. Yep. I have misunderstood. I mean, I'd, I'd be, be happy to. Too. We should be on this too. I would be happy to send that out to, the, to, to MASC. Whatever. Yeah, um, so, that's a good um, idea. Would you like a vote on this? Um, if, if, if the committee would is, is ready to vote on it, sure. I reviewed it, but did everyone get the chance to review the no, the letter? Because if not, then we could always do the vote next next meeting. I just read the whole thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was in agreement with Jim as well. So. Um, I think it's very well written. Yeah. yeah. I'm, okay. I read so it we're good. Okay. So I'll, uh, okay. I will entertain a motion. I would make a motion that we um, basically accept, approve. Um, there's no date on this, but that's all right. Um, concerning the uh, funding for the support of student academic and mental things with continuing some of the ESSER funds, <laughs> grants, funds, funds. It, it, they are grants, yes. Yeah. And grants. as a school committee, I would uh, motion that we support along Dr. Rinda as a support group. Do I have a second? <laughs> Seconded. Seconded. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all those in favor say aye. 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 It passes. Do we want, then want to edit 
and just have the school committee on here as additional support signees. Yeah. Or, that was actually going to be the. Uh, I saw Michelle's hand up. Yes. Also, I have everyone's electronic signature. If you're right. fine with right. me putting your electronic signature yes. on the letter, we yes. voted it. Yep, yeah. we voted it, so let's we do that. Have this. Yep, we're all here. We have the Absolutely. Committee. All right. Thank you. Um, and I am going to. So, for next steps, mm -hmm. I will follow up with Joyce's recommendation. Um, to make sure that we take this as far as possible. Great, thank you. Uh, I wanted to provide you an update with the Neshoba Valley Inn. Um, we, did I skip? No, I did not. A letter was sent to families on Friday, <coughs> September 29th, providing them with an update. Um, currently, we have nine students enrolled. Um, they're, they're, they're arriving on an ongoing basis. Um, so far, they've been, uh, they're absolutely wonderful additions. Um, most are, are have are attending Page Hilltop or the middle school. I believe the high school has has two um, currently, but this this number will certainly increase. Um, that is it as of now. And then I wanted to provide a high school gym update. We did send home a letter to families um, September 29th. I did delay that letter from the original my original intention because we were waiting. Um, for additional plans to come in, which they did. Um, so we have re received a repair that should be much faster to complete than what was originally intended. Um, we are preparing to go out to bid on that. Um, Mr. Uh, Plunkett has an update on that. However, this might be under the $50,000 threshold, so we are going to see um, if we can get, uh, while we're preparing and waiting to go out to bid, which he can give you the update in a minute, we are preparing to see if that is a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have, uh, I have been, uh, two, two local uh, families who do this work have reached out to me. Another family has reached out to Principal Christie who think they may um, be of, of help to us. Uh, so we will certainly um, explore that. And if we could come un in under the procurement, uh, procurement um, um, minimum, um, it would certainly speed up the process. Um, okay, yeah. okay, Madam Chair, we had uh, structural drawings uh, in hand on Friday, so, uh, and it is for a repair uh, to the gym uh, wall panel system. Uh, it will get us occupancy. It's a uh, horizontal C joist, it's like a, a stud that will go across the existing panels and be anchored on the existing framework, so those panels will not be able to fall in or out. Uh, the engineer, they brought on an architect to do the design and he feels that the drawings are um, sufficient for bidding and estimating and getting this under construction. Uh, the, the problem with the, the uh, bid process is uh, central register. Uh, they only publish a couple times a month, so the 11th was the first one I could get on. So you have to give them two weeks after the 11th, so bids would be due on the 25th. Uh, if we go through the complete bid process. If we get someone who comes in under the threshold of $50,000, all we need is three quotes uh, of, from a contractor who does this type of work and we can move forward. Uh, but we should go forward with the bid process because this is what happened to us back in May uh, when we lost an opportunity to get, get it done then. So um, if we come in under 50 with, with uh, someone who does this type of work, then that's great, and we get it done faster, and we save a couple of weeks. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, are you all set? For, for the gym? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Just yeah. Sure. yeah, I'm just struggling. I did not bring a prayer class, no so worries. I'm struggling <laughs> to see. My apologies. <laughs> 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 finish up the report? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Better? Oh, I can see. It's like a, it's like a whole new world. <laughs> Um, yes, Charlie agreed. At the last meeting, I, I was about to do that. Um, <laughs> um, Mr. Quinte, I believe you inquired of our, our poverty level for each town. So the, the federal poverty rate for air is actually 5.9%. The federal poverty rate for Shirley is 42 And the national poverty level is 115 Now, this is very different than what you would see on the school and district profiles as our uh, students living in poverty. Um, where at, uh, the district is at 33, 33 and a half percent 
uh, roughly. So this is everybody who lives in town, the average of, of, of all. Um, For our presentation, you might want to just, without doing too much digging, just get um, uh, similar numbers from prior censuses to show trends. So that would be interesting. Uh, yeah. That is a great suggestion. Actually, um, I was a bit shocked to see these numbers. So looking at the, the prior census would give us an indication. Absolutely do that. It also gives them an idea of what communities may be able to bear. We kind of get stuck on the way things have always been. Mm. Uh, we reached out to both towns um, asking that we be placed on an upcoming select board meeting agenda to provide an update on the federal entitlement grants and really the, the ESSER grants and uh, their ending. Um, so the select board meeting agenda, um, excuse me. So we will be presenting at the following select board meetings in air. We will present Tuesday, November 21st, and in Shirley, we're going to be presenting Monday, October 23rd. Do you have a time frame for that? I believe they start at six. The I, be, I don't know, not yet. Yeah. I don't think the, the agendas are, have been made for these meetings yet. Um, but we can we can share that with the school Surely committee. They once. start at six thirty, don't they? I believe they start at six thirty. Yes. Typically, if there's residents at these meetings, they 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 typically are at the front of the line and. You know, we get pushed back, which I, is appropriate. Uh, and that's appropriate. We should we should wait. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to give you a human resources update. Uh, Paige Hilltop has hired Miss Lynn Gogan as the newest member of the Grade Five team, uh, stepping in for Mr. Polizzi. She will be partnering with Allison uh, Pacello. Uh, Lynn has a bachelor's degree from Assumption College as well as a master's degree from Fitchburg State University. She has over 20 years of teaching experience, most of which at a, at, is at a fifth grade level. Uh, Lynn is very excited to be joining the Page Hilltop. She actually came to the open house um, to meet parents, even though she had not officially started yet. We really appreciate that she did that. Um, it's going to take her some time to get on board as she transitions from a, a private school into the district, but um, um, we certainly have all the, edu the experienced educators that we need to assist her with this. So this is an athletic um, update submitted by Mr. Kendall. I apologize that it is not Mr. Kendall delivering this, but I'll do my best. Uh, the fall season, him. what's that? You could record him. You know what, maybe we'll do that. <laughs> maybe we'll do that. Uh, the fall season is going strong. Most sports have just two weeks left in the regular season. Unified basketball started today. The team will play four games plus a jamboree over the next month. We wanna um, send congratulations to our unified programs in the high school as Air Shirley Regional High School earned national banner school honors from the Special Olympics in North America. Only 22 schools in Massachusetts earned this recognition. So go Panthers. Boys varsity soccer is 6-3-1 and, and currently ranked 24th in the state power rankings for Division 5. Top 32 plus anyone over 500 qualifies for the state tournament. So we are in good shape as of now. The boys JV team is unbeaten in Ost Ludenberg Thursday, October 5th at 5. Girls varsity soccer is playing well under first year coach Bill Naylor. The girls are two, six and one and rank 30th in the state power rankings. The JV girls are five, one and one, <coughs> despite playing with entirely seventh and eighth graders. We've got some, uh, some powerhouse teams coming up. Uh, the middle school teams are also playing well. We are able to host games on site on the field built by Bill Woodward in 2020 as it's finally matured. Thanks to Bill, Keith uh, Begun, Linda, Cornier, Ray Millette, and Jeff Thomas for their help getting the field ready to play games on. It saves us a bus to a wild road, uh, to wild road for home games. That's much appreciated. It's nice for the students to be able to walk right outside onto their field. Uh, girls volleyball currently is four and five and ranked 35, 35th in power rankings. JV is having a strong season at four and two. The team hosts Abby Kelly Wednesday, October 4th at four and five, and Lemonster on Friday, October 7th, at four and five, for the Dig Pink Nights. All games are in the middle school gym. Varsity Golf is 8-0, including a huge win over a strong Hopkinton team. They, inclitch, they have clinched the spot in sectionals for the fourth straight year. <coughs> Excuse me. The varsity has been extremely competitive. Sen senior Tyler Crawford had a hole-in-one last week at Northern Spy. 
while Sohil Patel, Addie Patel, Reed Onation, Tommy Burgeon, Jason Turner, and Maverick Dusty have been outstanding. The team hosts Clinton and Tahanto on Wednesday, October 4th, as they look for a fourth straight league title. JV Golf has had some, a number of matches that has been showing improvement. The football team has been playing well despite an 0-4 record. James Gauntlet has a strong senior season. The JV team sits at 2-2. The varsity is at Quabbin on Friday, October 6th, while the JV hosts Quabbin on Monday, October 9th at 11. Cheerleading has been great at home games, and they continue to prepare for league competitions this winter. Both cross-country teams are rolling along at 4-0. The boys have been led by Jake uh, Leone, Cole New, Jack Holden, Johnny McGrath, Ryan Gill, Cole Hinley Kletzka, while the girls have been led by Carolyn Mason, Jan Marshall, Marissa Grace, Ada and Devin Perwak, Lily Albelson, and Neve Fallon. The first year middle school cross country team has 20 participants under coach Trey Skipper. The team is at Hale Middle School this Thursday, October 5th, before hosting Littleton next Thursday, October 12th, at the Middle School. And that is all for the sports report, and we absolutely are taping Mr. Um, <laughs> Kendall to do that next time. I don't know if he can get his grin in the tape. <laughs> um, and that is all for the superintendent's report. Okay, so we do not have any ongoing business. For the policy review um, report, there is none. We're supposed to be reviewing the entire draft of policies that we have, so that next school committee meeting, we're gonna be voting in the policies. Yes, sir. Um, I've gone through the fact, I mean, of, of all the policies that we've had to do, I mean, students is by far mm. the most involved because that's what we do when I have Boku, Changes, thoughts, that just, I mean, across the board, they're not just, there are some minor edits, but mostly there are things that um, probably would require the review of the entire committee to decide what particular directions to go. So I don't, I don't see, I don't, I don't know what next meeting will look like, but it seems like it would take a, an extended period of time to go through just check. I mean, the other policies are, are relatively simple, but Jay is basically why we're here as a school that deals with all student things. Okay. Um, so what we can do is if I can coordinate with you, get your suggested edits, then I can put them in the folder for us to kind of prepare and review in it before we have the next meeting so that that way if we are able to address some of those things we could do that because I mean if there are sections that we know we'll go through we all approve and let's say we need to work on J if we all see the edits ahead of time it might go a little bit smoother um, so I could do that and coordinate that with you okay anybody else um, I have some for section D, just some of those um, threshold changes, like in the finance one. Do you want me to do the same thing? Yep. Just send it to you to put. Okay. Yeah, and, and we'll put it in there just so that way we all can review it. We'll, we'll be as prepared as we can be. Um, so that's great. So, do you remember what section that is? Yeah, it's D. section D. Okay. Um, a couple, like, right now, different pages in there, so I can just send you all that. Yeah, okay. And she's a student. Okay. So I'll make sure I circle back. And Michelle, circle back with you. Yes, ma'am? Um, I don't believe that the whole committee has seen a red line version of section I, okay. which is instructional program, I believe. So I reached out to Dorothy Presser last week, but she's on vacation until October 13th. Okay. I don't know if she maybe sent something to you or Chris. I didn't see any email with section I. It was on the agenda for a summer meeting, yep. but the, uh, the other sections she had sent, she may have just, because there, there, the was, there was a lot of review over the summer, so it's possible that she just, you know, it was an oversight. Okay. Yes, Trace. Do we have an antici anticipation of the time allowance that we need for that, for that review? And if it's extensive, should it be in a separate individual meeting that doesn't contain any other business oh that's a good idea i think if it's it based upon the feedback that i'm getting now 
maybe we should make it a separate I mean, meeting. We can. We can, no, we so maybe we should. So you take out superintendent stuff and minutes and stuff, and you just yes. do a policy, policy review. review. Oh, it's a public meeting, yep. but just policy review, and then you don't go till midnight where no one can think. Right, so I think that that's an excellent suggestion. Yes, sure sir. May. Just just a heads up, the next meeting, there will be three school improvement plan presentations. Yes. That's right. So how about this? I will coordinate um, with you all. So I'll you know send the email to myself and then blind copy you all with suggested dates for um, a policy review. And then we'll just review all of the policies separately. Then that way, you're right. We don't have to have an extended period, and we'll be able to focus on the school you're improvement plan. Just that. Yes, and, absolutely. Um, I think it just comes out clearer because mm -hmm. you're not so tired and yes. thinking of five thousand other things. Yeah. Um, I assume that probably we could have the schools anytime. We probably need them. They're not overscheduled, Mr. Plunkett. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Any limitation on that. I think we can find you a spot. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so I will send out um, something, if not tonight, then tomorrow morning, just to check with everybody in their schedule so that we can get the policy review completed, um, which takes a load off. Okay. Thank you for that suggestion, Joyce. Um, other than that, so I'm going to move on to chairperson's notes, which I don't have any because I was more focused on our policy review coming up. So I feel a little bit better. So we'll have at least a two week extension um, to review the policies further and then give voice to the, uh, the suggested changes that we have coming. Um, so that is beneficial. Um, are there any other topics for discussion not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance of this meeting? Uh, I don't have any. Everybody good? Yay. Um, communications? Yep. Uh, announcements for October 3rd, 2023. Um, on Thursday, October 5th, the College MIFA informational night will be at 6.30 in the high school LGI room. On Thursday, October 5th, Page Hilltop PTO meeting, 6.30, Page Hilltop Cultural Arts Center. On Saturday, October 7th, Air Shirley High School homecoming dance, 7 o'clock in the high school. On Wednesday, October 11th, a 90-minute early release for grades preschool through 12, professional development for teachers, lunch will be served, dismissal times for high school and middle school at 12.15 p.m. in Law and Page Hilltop at 1.45 p.m. Wednesday, October 11th, Air Shirley Education Foundation meeting at 7 o'clock in the high school media center. On Wednesday, October 18th, school committee meeting, 6.30, the middle school library on Wednesday, October 25th, a 90 minute early release for grades preschool through 12 and professional development for teachers. Lunch will be served, dismissal times high school, middle school at 12.15 p.m. Law and Page Hilltop at 1.45 p.m. Thursday, October 26th, 90 minute early release for grades six to eight or parent guardian conferences. Lunch will be served. Dismissal time is at 12.15 p.m. And Friday, October 27, 90-minute early release for grades 6 to 8 for parent guardian conferences. Lunch will be served. Dismissal time is 12.15 p.m. That is it. Thank you. Okay, so we do have executive session. And I swear I read Robert's rules and we have this, but it is escaping me. So. We are supposed to adjourn. adjourn to go into executive session. Thank we will you. only return to adjourn the meeting and we will not conduct any other meeting at all. Business. Thank you know, you. meeting. Yes. Thank you so much, <laughs> Joyce. I appreciate that. So we don't need to note the time now, do we? Or we no. do adjourn. Okay. No, Thank we, you. Yes. You know, I'd, you need to the time time you the I'd make a motion that we adjourn the regular session at 8.13 in order to enter executive session. With a five minute recess. With a five minute recess. Thank you. <laughs> All right, seconded by Ashley. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, adjourn regular session.